Hey, 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 wanted to hop back in with a different video than usual because I want to talk about some of the criticisms that Cuphead has gotten. When I was doing my first video and I was on Wikipedia, I noticed there was an article that went around about the reception of Cuphead being a little bit more negative. So this is a direct response to that Escapist Magazine article about Cuphead, but this applies to more shows than just Cuphead. I'm just using that as the example for this video, but let's go through this together. Also plug in my Discord. Cuphead was one of the best games of 2017. A tough as nails, boss rush, run and gun platformer, highly regarded for its animation inspired by Max Fleischer cartoons and early Disney. So it made perfect sense when Netflix announced the Cuphead show as an actual animated series, which finally released its first season on February 18th. Unlike the game, however, the reception to the show has been a lot more mixed. I've read through a lot of reviews and I've watched a few videos on it, and I definitely think if this was mixed, then we don't have a lot of positively reviewed shows. And the problem with placing a game on how something is viewed is you're inevitably going to have a blind spot and my perspective is no different. From my view, the show seems to be rated generally positively. A 7.7 .7 on IMDb, a 79% on Rotten Tomatoes, or 67 if you count critics, and generally positive reviews on YouTube and Twitter. Again, that's not a full consensus, but there are more shows out there that I feel are mixed and Cuphead doesn't really appear to be one of them. Both fans and critics have been left disappointed by the series due to its lack of substance and short nature. I even did a double take when I saw the first season consisted of 12 episodes, yet each episode was about 12 minutes long. Many fans have said that the series only loosely follows the game structure and feels like a generic kid show. And you know what? That's okay. It's perfectly fine for the Cuphead show to target younger children and not adults or gamers who played the original game. In fact, that was probably the smartest decision that Netflix Animation, King Feature Syndicate, and Studio MDHR made about the show. I want to pick apart this piece here because it sets up the expectation of what the next paragraphs are going to be. There are many Netflix animated shows that are praised for their story and direction, as well as their short seasons being complemented by a longer episode duration. Hilda, Bojack, Disenchantment, Arcane, just to name a few, are longer than your average 12 minute cartoon, but that doesn't necessarily mean that short episodes should cause disappointment. Note, the article says that it's due to the lack of substance and short nature, not lack of substance because of a short nature, meaning that the short nature is a criticism and an unfair one. There are plenty of wacky 12 minute shows I've seen throughout the years of me doing this that is really good at what the show wants to accomplish. And when you view a show that is 22 minutes and has a lot more layers, you should then not view a 12 minute episode that has less layers and judge them as if they're on the same playing field. I would never watch something like The Owl House and then go to Teen Titans Go or Big City Greens if we're keeping the analogy on Disney and expect that they would be on the same playing field, like they would need to fill the same needs, and vice versa. I wouldn't look at Big City Greens and then watch The Owl House and expect it to fill that same need. That's like watching King of the Hill at 8 p.m. on Adult Swim and then Robot Chicken and then Family Guy and Futurama and then expecting all of those four shows to fit the same gap. Good to meet you, Molly. I'll be back later for your career. Each show, like on Netflix, they have their own targets and preferences and required amount of substance. In fact, episodic shows do just as good with less layers because there isn't a need or expectation for continuity or arcs, although they are appreciated. Now you must ask, well, what does Cuphead want to accomplish? Well, the next paragraph says it quite succinctly. The Cuphead show follows Cuphead and Mugman and the misadventures that they go on. A third of the episodes deal with how Cuphead is trying to get away from the devil after losing a game of skee-ball, but the majority of them are situational comedies that are entirely self-contained. One episode has Cuphead and Mugman stuck in a cemetery trying to escape. Another has the pair go on an adventure for the local merchant pork rind among many others. Cuphead is your stereotypical hyper-energetic kid with a cocky attitude, while Mugman is his Luigi. The two bicker but ultimately work together to solve whatever problem comes their way. One thing that does frustrate me with this article is that they completely understand what the show wants to be. It doesn't want to be a long trek. It wants to be a fun, silly, wacky 12 minutes of your time, self-contained, but with small trinkets of continuity and basically be an adventure packed the same way a lot of shows in a previous decades were. With that knowledge, what would substance mean in this instance, in this context? Because I see that word get thrown around a lot, and the thing about substance is, it's tangible. Hold it! Say, Cuphead, why are we fighting again? 
Uh, cause we're not supposed to? Right! To me, for the Cuphead show to have substance, it needs to have a coherent story, good enough art, good enough animation, characters you connect with, great jokes because it's a comedy. And in this case, references to the game because you're using the property of something that people understand to have come from a game. I'm personally not defining anything above that foundation as substance, but it would be appreciated. And I think Cuphead does a good job on all of those things. The story of them having these adventures in ink well, Isles is coherent and understood in each of the 12 episodes so far. I connect with both Cuphead and Mugman and most recently Miss Chalice. And the art style and animation and music is more than good enough. It's actually great. And there's a lot of comedy and references that fans of the game would enjoy. We're, uh, orphans. Yeah, that's it. Orphans. Wait, we're orphans? Oh, that's so sad! Hey, he's up on the waterworks, will ya? Would I have appreciated it if they built up more of a devil arc, or King Dice gets an arc, or Pork Rind, or Elder Kettle some more? Sure, but they don't need to, because it's very clear that this is supposed to mirror shows like Spongebob, Chowder, Gumball, Ed and Eddie, Phineas and Ferb, early seasons of regular show Fairly Odd Parents, shows that were mostly contained in a vacuum and went on to be successful. All of them had enough substance to gain fans and have a a long lasting impression on their respective networks. So what exactly is wrong with having a situational comedy? Mind you, the article doesn't have much to say when it comes to these episodes. It doesn't talk a lot about the comedy in this situational comedy. It only talks about the arcs, despite being self-aware later that this was made with children in mind. It speaks very little on the aesthetic, the comedy as I said before, the main character dynamics, and the quality of this situational comedy. By the way, the first seasons of all the shows I mentioned earlier, Spongebob, Gumball, Ball regular show, they were almost always looked as underdeveloped when in reality it just takes a while to find your footing when it comes to a new show. Look at the first season of CV Universe and then look at any other season of CV Universe. Look at the first season of regular show. Look at the first season of Gumball Clarence. There's a giant discussion today about early Spongebob, the current Spongebob. And I think certain critics fall into this trap of looking at another show season three and four and then thinking that another show should have these things in place. This should all be familiar to fans of classic animation. Looney Tunes follows this exact same structure where a central character gets into cartoony shenanigans that are quickly resolved. It's refreshing to see it return in the Cuphead show since it's almost entirely opposite of what we expect modern day cartoons to be like. We expect cartoons nowadays to have a lot more narrative substance to them. It's hard to watch shows like Avatar The Last Airbender, Voltron Legendary Defender, The Owl House, or She-Ra and the Princess of Power and expect anything other than a multiple season epic from its contemporaries. But that ignores where the vast root of animation stems from. No, 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 no. No. My main issue with this article is that it comes from a semi-apologist angle where a lot of it is set up as everyone is looking for this, but it's okay if we don't have it because X, Y, and Z. Ironically, the clues as to what makes this a silly paragraph come from the exact franchise it mentions first, Looney Tunes. Grand mummy, one day when I'm grown, will you give me your pearls? I wear this for medical reasons. Looney Tunes is so praised and loved today, not because of its narrative substance, but because it understands what it wants to do and delivers in a way that made it a classic. The dynamic of Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote, Bugs and Daffy as characters alone, Elmer Fudd as a supporting character, Tweety and Sylvester's dynamic. It was a very simple story, but it had strong characters that you can laugh with, relate to, connect to, or want to see them get their comeuppance. By this logic, you'd want to see Cuphead if it had those things as well if it had a simple story. Not comparing it to the Looney Tunes, but comparing it to a show trying to be episodic and simple and have everything in a vacuum or most things in a vacuum like the Looney Tunes or the Looney Tunes show. So in this instance, does it have the character dynamics? Are the jokes funny? Is the story set up clear for anyone, in this case, children, to understand? The answer is yes, honestly. <laughs> Cut it. Watch it! Now look at what you made me do! <laughs> I utterly despise this sentiment that is expected for new shows that have the structure of an Avatar, Owl House, Eve Universe, Adventure Time, Gravity Falls, She-Ra to be seen as a good animated show. I despise this idea that the good animation can only come from shows that build across multiple episodes or have character arcs or the darker second or third season. Story-based shows and episodic shows should not have the same expectations. That's like expecting the bass of a dubstep song to be the same as a rock song. 
you're gonna be disappointed and you're already misguided. This is how I know this article is misguided because you're putting shows with narrative substance as a show to be expected when a lot of cartoonists, both making cartoons or developing cartoons and also cartoon fans do enjoy when cartoon episodes are just self-contained in a vacuum. Where the pros of story-based shows are that you can get a better sense of connection with the characters because the stories are built purposefully to develop the characters over time and thus can provide a lot more depth. The pros of episodic based shows are that the development of these characters are not limited to an ongoing narrative and thus you can create a wider spectrum of development because each adventure can tell a different part of the character succinctly without needing to stick to an ongoing narrative. I think you multi-celled organisms are like so complex. The first season of The Owl House would do a great job at establishing Luz's need to become a witch and fulfill a dream, and it's met with the obstacles of Hexide, her social life starting from zero as she meets new faces, and the most wanted curse aspects of her teacher. Is it the curse? Maybe it is the curse, but then how pathetic are you? that you can't best me at my worst. However, while this allows for Luz and the lore to be developed with more depth and substance, narrative substance, contrast this with the first season of Fairly Odd Parents, for example. There is no ongoing narrative, but it covers a wide variety of subjects that matter and would allow you to connect with the main characters, albeit in a thinner manner, but regardless, allows for you to get engrossed in the world just as much. We have Timmy learning about the rules in The Big Problem, Timmy's relationship with his best friends AJ and Chester and Power Mad, I have three lives. learning about the lore in Space Out, learning about Crash Nebula, learning about his teacher and Chance parents, learning about his love for Trixie and A Wish Too Far, bonding with famous superhero Crimson Chin and Chinna, and learning more about Vicky and Tiny Timmy, but also Dog's Day Afternoon, and then learning about Cosmo and Wanda specifically in a partnership. All of this happens in the first season, and it's actually a very good season because it shows you the world that you can get engrossed in. That's him? What's the big deal? He's just a smelly old goat. <laughs> Who said that? How dare you minimize the importance of chopping? Both approaches work, and this idea that anyone should expect modern cartoons to only take the former approach is not only whack, but you're missing out on lighter shows that you can watch in tandem with heavier shows like the ones I mentioned. And while I do appreciate that this article is self-aware that most cartoons started out with a very bare bones plot, we are not that far away from that. And I wish this article would take modernized versions of these episodic shows into consideration for their review rather than stacking it against shows that it's not even trying to be like. Honestly, if you were expecting Cuphead to be anywhere in the ballpark of shows like Avatar and She-Ra in the Owl House, then I can understand why you'd be disappointed and you would think that the show is not made for you. Animated shows are traditionally meant to be syndicated for reruns on television at a moment's notice and to bolster a cable lineup whenever necessary. The problem nowadays is that shows like these don't mesh well with a streaming service like Netflix. There is no syndication for a streaming service, just content. But when you really get down to it, Cuphead as a game almost does function like a syndicated TV show. Content doesn't need an ongoing narrative to be good on streaming services. Content doesn't need to be wholly connected to be good on streaming services. I don't know how else to say it. Within the world of animation, people still speak about early SpongeBob episodes like Band Geeks and Pizza Delivery, all the way to shows like Gumball and Big City Greens. And let's not forget that Family Guy is still going strong today, and that does not have an ongoing narrative. I got a Barbie with a wiener on it. Took a thumb from a G.I. Joe, put it on with super glue. Does a job. Does what job? You get it. But let's take this logic with other pieces of media. Mr. Beast is one of the biggest creators on the platform. He doesn't have an ongoing narrative in his videos. Yes, we have ongoing narratives on YouTube, such as SMPs, for example, that were or are quite popular. But for every one of those, look at successful channels that have content that connects with people that doesn't have an ongoing narrative that's on a streaming service. I'm pretty sure YouTube is a streaming service. I'm, I'm fairly certain. Most music out right now doesn't have an ongoing narrative on it and it's also on a streaming service. Sometimes you just like albums or singles because they're really good. A person who enjoys certain games like The Sims, Minecraft, Fortnite, they're not gonna like it because it has an ongoing narrative in it. If something is good, you're gonna wanna engage in it as much as you possibly can. An ongoing narrative is not the barrier to something being good on a streaming service. 
post editing Jay here. I just wanted to clear up any confusion before it starts. There are a lot of points in my video where I am using the words ongoing narrative and narrative substance interchangeably. And I feel like in this example here, it may be a little bit confusing because there is a lot of narrative substance in a lot of the media that I said here. So let me be clear. I am only using ongoing narrative and narrative substance interchangeably because the article heavily implies that the shows that are story driven, continuity driven, and have an ongoing narrative are the shows that we as animation fans look forward to because that is what's considered narrative substance. Not shows that have self-contained stories within a vacuum that isn't necessarily considered narrative substance as per what this article both implies and gives no examples towards. This means that I am not alleging that there isn't any narrative substance in games such as The Sims and Minecraft where people do inject their own personal stories and narratives into the games to make it fun. What I'm saying, especially in these examples, is that you do not need another installment of this particular game to understand the next game. You do not need to play The Sims 3 to understand The Sims 4. You do not need to know the previous Minecraft update to understand the next Minecraft update. So do keep that in mind. I'm only using these words interchangeably because that is what the article implies. This isn't to say that story heavy YouTubers or story heavy music or story heavy games are rare or bad. There's a lot out there that's really good. Just because we moved on to on demand services and people now get to pick when and how much of a show they want to watch doesn't mean that it should be expected that the content should have an ongoing narrative. If the content is good, it doesn't need an ongoing narrative. If you haven't noticed, we're on the fifth paragraph of this article and it only has said that it has a feel of a generic kids show with no reasons to support that other than a lack of narrative substance, which this article equates to shows that have an ongoing narrative. Well, to some, this may speak to them. Generally, when you're writing a review or opinion piece, it's not written just, if at all, for the person that agrees with them already. Hey boys, how's that? Let's pretend that when they say narrative substance, they're not just talking about an ongoing narrative. Then Cuphead actually still has narrative substance. We learn in Carnival that Cuphead is not only a lot more brave than Mugman, but their bickering and back and forths are just a flaw that they share. Often not being on the same page until their lives, or in the first episode's case, Cuphead's soul is on the line. Carnival. Con evil. Evil! <laughs> we learned that the devil is a very self-centric being who underestimates Cuphead justifiably in the Sweater Off Dead episodes, that he would often need Mugman's focus, cautious-minded reinforcement in order to keep his soul, for now. Even King Dice in Roll the Dice wasn't able to outsmart Cuphead, who isn't depicted to be that crafty, but simply someone who has a lot more confidence than his skill set may lead you to think is justified. My name is Cuphead, I like roller coasters and hot dogs and tilt the world and hot dogs and flying swings and hot dogs and throwing up in roller coasters in that order. So in addition to building on Cuphead's empty cupped bravado, Mugman's wacky but cautious support, the devil's arrogant vanity and King Dice's empty promises, that's called narrative substance. Just because King Dice didn't get an arc and Mugman and Cuphead didn't spend the next five to six episodes building up the devil doesn't mean that it lacks narrative substance. It has less depth than shows like The Owl House, Avatar, and she -Ra. Yes, but that does not take away from it being engaging or having substance. It's an episodic show and a modern take on that And this allows for other adventures to be told in tandem with the narrative that Cuphead's soul belongs to the devil Although these episodes with the exception of Sweater Off Dead, which is a two-part episode can be viewed in a vacuum There's already a narrative being built with Cuphead and the devil that I will get to when the time comes Each stage is entirely self-contained and you can fight the brutal bosses in largely whatever order you like Likewise, you can go back to them whenever you like to be entertained. Indeed, beyond their imaginative designs, the bosses have no character to them whatsoever except King Dice and the Devil, and attempting to give them any personality other than bad guy wouldn't make sense. Why would you devote time to flesh out a boss's history if you're never going to think about them once you beat them? The bosses are perfect for syndication. I'm assuming what they're referring to when speaking about this is the episodes Baby Bottle, Ruby and Croaks, and Root Pact, episodes that had a one-shot antagonist. This article seems to not understand that minor 
villains can be a useful tool to an episodic show. Here's the thing, I'm not gonna say that these antagonists have depth compared to The Devil and King Dice, even though King Dice technically only had one episode, so I'm not sure what benchmark this article is using here, but the way that episodic shows work, because each episode is in a vacuum, the antagonists are going to be thinner by comparison to shows that may build them up across episodes or seasons. Ah, on fire! You say it's my fault? So what if I am? However, the challenge that one-shot antagonists have to face is that they need to be instantly recognizable off the bat. And I would say that Ribby and Croaks, the frog brother duo that serve as a distinct antagonist that you cannot confuse with anyone else, passes that challenge with flying colors. Their on-site approach to fighting and voice direction make them a fun minor villain to what is already a stacked deck of bosses. In fact, the more I think about it, it's actually a very good thing that not every villain in Cuphead has depth. Why should every villain in Cuphead need depth? The way that the game is designed, there are a lot of characters you meet along the way through these stages, not all of them are weighted equally. That would be like if Arcane decided to have a subplot just for the minions who life purpose are to run into turrets and take the hit. The beauty of storytelling is that minor villains can serve a great purpose towards a grander vision. It's like wrestling. If you want to be seen and believed as a top guy, you probably need to take out some guys on your way to the top, defeating a lot of mid carters as well. The same goes for any other story. Would Avatar be the same if Aang only had one or two antagonists built up for the entire story? Isn't some of your favorite episodes of Avatar involving characters that only show up once or twice? It has nothing to do with syndication. It has everything to do with how you wish to display your story and understanding what focus means. The Owl House has some decent one-time antagonists that have no contribution to the main story. This article tries to understand this point, but when you consider their original stance on it being a generic kid show, I personally see this more as misguided than self Aware. But even if I did have issues with how the show implements its references and callbacks, it doesn't really matter because I'm not the target audience. The Cuphead show is a series aimed at kids 7 and up. It's a children's show. To criticize it harshly for not being like the game or being aimed at a younger audience is missing the point. In fact, I'm pretty sure that most people who watch the Cuphead show will have never played the game it's directly based on. Kids will discover a bouncy, energetic cartoon and will probably find what's here incredibly entertaining. It's sentiments like this that really kill the term family show because Cuphead can be enjoyed by everyone there's no way that the show is written that it can't and just like many other shows out there it could be enjoyed by the whole family I like to ask the person who made this article what really stops me someone who's older from watching this with my brothers who enjoy and have played and have beaten Cuphead nothing in fact I want to ask the person who wrote this article if they still play games like Mario Sonic Pokemon Ratchet and Clank Fortnite properties that adults very much like but still target themselves partially or wholly to kids. I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that you can't dislike Cuphead. I'm saying based off of this article, their points are it doesn't have an ongoing narrative or narrative substance, and the bosses turned antagonists for episodes are what makes it a generic kid show. What about the fact that Cuphead and Mugman have a great dynamic? Are great dynamics not a thing for older audiences? What about the fact that they have great music and a great aesthetic? Are great music and great aesthetics only for a younger audience? Do gamers not care about fight scenes? How about the fact that you can like the game and like the show and not want the show to be like the game? If a Sly Cooper show came out, one of my favorite games, I would be okay if it wanted to be a heist of the week 52 episodic approach. I would be okay if they wanted to do a gritty or dark approach, if they wanted to take the piss out of it and go to Teen Titans Go approach, or if it wanted to do something else. If the show is good, then it's good. Ongoing narrative is a tool. Major and minor villains are a tool. These are not bench marks these are not required making it episodic thus lacking that ongoing narrative and also having some villains that are thin and also being aimed towards kids doesn't make it generic or not for gamers in fact wasn't half of the popular games for the last five years super colorful wild wacky and not meant to be taken as an ongoing narrative or super dark or not have super deep villains if any at all I feel like this article is talking about a very very specific kind of gamer and in ironic sense of trying to be self-aware, it assumes that gamers fit a specific enough mold to base an entire article on it, right after saying that they shouldn't be the voice to determine if it's enjoyable, only then to continue to try to cover their tracks. If this is the stance you're gonna take, you also shouldn't be the determining factor on what gamers like because it's far too broad to assume that Cuphead isn't made for any of them. Because that's not just the title of this, that is the premise of this entire article, that is the theme that keeps getting reinforced with each 
each paragraph. It's not just a title. The person who made this article meant that stance. More importantly, a parent who may be interested in showing their child this will find that there aren't any negative messages here either. Cuphead is a mischievous little scamp, sure, but when he makes a mistake, he does learn his lesson by the end of the episode. The comedy is solid, and it doesn't differ too much from classic Looney Tunes or even 90s Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network shows. The second to last paragraph, and you finally get around to the comedy, and you say that it's solid. Why is it solid? Do you like the characters? Do you like the music? Is the animation really good? Is the art style really good? The Cuphead show isn't a revolutionary feat of animation or a grand narrative journey, but it's not trying to be. It's just trying to be an entertaining kids show. And it stands out from the crowd, not only with its retro inspired animation, but also its retro production style. Adults can enjoy it, and I certainly had some fun with it, but I'm not the target audience, and that's okay. This isn't a show that will appeal to hardcore gamers, like maybe Halo will, and that's also okay. I love the original game, and the series, while not perfect, is good enough and will tide me over until the delicious last course releases in June. Ah, <sighs> it only took you until the very last paragraph to say that it's trying to be an entertaining kids show, and the entire article is explaining everything except why it's not an entertaining kids show. It's explaining everything besides that. It's actually incredibly hilarious because you're self-aware that the target audience for your website is hardcore gamers, so you talk about things like villains and narratives when you are way too self-aware that it's not for just hardcore gamers. They can enjoy it, but it's primarily for kids. And you put the standard on hardcore gamers anyway because that's what your website has. That's insane to me. All right, post-editing Jay coming back one more time. I want to be super clear here because the last article has a lot of agreeable points in it, such as it's trying to be an entertaining kids show, adults can enjoy it, and that obviously the person who wrote this had some fun with it. The issue I have with the article is that it has a dismissive tone and sets up the show to a standard that it would have otherwise never have given a second thought to because that's not what it's trying to be in the first place. This would be the equivalent of going on Amazon and buying a chair and seeing that the top most critical review was looking at it from the perspective of being a good table. There are so many shows out there that this article could have pointed to, such as other shows based off of video game properties, and the only ones that it pointed to were shows with an ongoing narrative masking that as narrative substance, even though it says in this last paragraph that it's not trying to be like that, so you would have to question why they would bring that up in the first place. Again, I am not saying that it's not okay to criticize Cuphead the show. I am only saying that the argument that they have here is terrible and it sets the show up for something that it's not trying to be and is being listed as a credible source of reception from someone who is not watching the show from the standard or from the expertise of what it is in the first place. To give a specific analogy here, just because you're a gamer does not mean that you understand game design. Just because you're a gamer doesn't mean that you understand animations that are based off of video games and what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish, and what they're trying to be. While in a vacuum, it has a self-aware sense of trying to be fair, and I do appreciate the article for at least trying to be fair. Here's why this is actually harmful. While I understand that The Escapist brands itself as a video game magazine website, this is being used as an actual source because Wikipedia and a lot of other websites like it prefer old media as the primary source of reception. Those places don't care that the animation community, like myself, get thousands, sometimes even hundreds hundreds of thousands of views on these shows and give our reviews on it, but that's not even the point. I would speculate that this person does not watch any animation if they believe that the best comparison to make to Cuphead is Looney Tunes and 90s Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network shows. Mau Mau, It's Pony, Minimal's Post, Johnny Test, Gumball, Mighty Magiswords, Fanboy and Chum Chum, SpongeBob, Rise of the TMNT, Bunsen is a Beast, Robot and Monster, Teen Titans Go, Molly McGee, Victor and Valentino, OKKO, okay, Ben 10, Big City Greens, Chowder, Flapjack, Phineas and Ferb, all of these shows shows are recent and either partially or wholly episodic, super wacky, have minor villains that don't have that much depth, and have episodes that exist within a vacuum and compare to certain other shows like Avatar, She-Ra, Voltron, and The Owl House have less quote narrative substance that you keep referring to, and are successful in their own directions. 
And guess what? You can like any of the shows I mentioned in this entire video and be a hardcore gamer. In fact, if you like any of these episodic shows and you consider yourself to be a hardcore gamer or a fan of Cuphead the game, let me know in the comments down below. And I want to address the elephant in the room. This video came out at a funny time because my last video, Fairy Otter Was Not Made For You, has a similar structure that I'm talking about a show not being made for a particular audience. And I just want to say, my response to that is, Fairly Otter's structure was me speaking from a fan of Fairly Odd Parents talking about a live action show within the same universe. This is trying to speak to hardcore gamers and compare that to a kid show. I've been doing this for six years, about to be seven years, and one of the biggest reasons as to why I started was because when I was watching people speak about animation, they spoke about CV Universe and Adventure Time and My Little Pony and Gravity Falls and Avatar. They spoke about Bojack. They spoke about Rick and Morty. They spoke about Family Guy. And there's nothing wrong with these shows. In fact, they deserve the praise and analysis or criticism that they receive. But there's a whole world of fun shows that exist in this episodic spectrum where there isn't an ongoing narrative, but there are memorable episodes and memorable characters. I love episodic shows. It's the entire reason as to why I do this and to why 80% of what I cover, probably even 90%, is episodic shows. Like I grew up on Billy and Mandy, Invader Zim, Camp Laszlo, SpongeBob, Fairly Odd Parents, Jimmy Neutron, Teenage Robot, Ed, Ed and Eddie Foster's Home, I can go on and on. I'm okay with people having a preference, but this assumption and disinterest in episodic shows when it comes to media reviewers, it's just something that annoys me. I'm sure the person who wrote this is a good person and watches a lot of great media. And I wish hopefully them and anyone else who hasn't could just give episodic shows a chance on their own standard and not something else's. Until then, take care. Off out.